The Shulman, lead author of the late-breaking abstract titled Exercise and Gait-Related Disability in Parkinson's Disease. Dr. Shulman's research is embargoed until 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Hawaiian time, again tomorrow, Tuesday, April 12, 2011. Welcome, Dr. Shulman. Okay, well, thank you, and good morning. Uh, so, uh, gait impairment and loss of mobility is the single greatest cause of disability in Parkinson's disease. And although it makes sense to look at exercise as possibly uh, being efficacious for these problems, and our current therapies are not adequate to improve uh, gait and mobility, there really has been relatively uh, little focus over the years in non-pharmacologic interventions like exercise uh, due to actually uh, inadequate funding. But recently, there's a lot more interest around the area and, and certainly more work. And uh, this study uh, is uh, one of the larger studies that's ever been done in this area in Parkinson's disease. It's a randomized, single-blinded clinical trial of efficacy of three different models of exercise to improve gait and mobility in Parkinson's disease. So we compared three different interventions. The first is a high-intensity treadmill uh, training uh, intervention. The second, a low-intensity treadmill training intervention. And the third was a stretching and resistance training. All three arms, whether a patient was randomized to any of these three arms, they were training for three times a week for three months. So let me tell you a little bit about the three arms and what the training entailed. If you were randomized to the high-intensity uh, treadmill training, the patient started at 15 minutes, and they were encouraged to increase their duration, velocity, and incline until they reached 30 minutes for each training period at 70 to 80 percent of their heart rate reserve, which is based on their uh, age and their resting heart rate. For the low-intensity tr walking on the treadmill, they also started at 15 minutes, but they walked at their comfortable pace, their self-selected pace that they would walk ordinarily, and they were encouraged week by week to reach a target of 50 minutes versus the 30 minutes of the higher intensity work. They went to 50 minutes, but at 40 to 50 percent heart rate reserve. So it was less intense in terms of the aerobic stimulus. There wasn't incline of velocity, but it was longer in duration. Finally, the third group, the stretching resistance group, had resistance exercises of the lower body followed by stretching of the upper and lower body. And this entailed two sets of 10 repetitions of three different exercises on machines. And these were leg press, leg extension, and leg curl. These patients were encouraged to increase their uh, resistance that they could manage, their muscle strengthening over time. All three groups were able to increase uh, over time such that Everybody in the velocity group, the group that was going at higher velocity, got to 30 minutes at an increased incline and velocity. The duration group, the lower intensity treadmill group, got to 50 minutes. And the resistance group increased their uh, muscle uh, strengthening, or their resistance, I should say, by 50%. Uh, they were able to increase their weight uh, that they could manage by 50%. So in terms of the population that we recruited, there were 67 patients in total. So therefore, there were 22 to 23 people in each of the study arms. The gender breakdown was 75% male and 25% female. The mean age was 66 years of age, but the patients varied or ranged from 42 years to 86 years of age. And the mean duration of disease was about six years, although the range was from one to 18 years of age. So now for the results. So there were a number of areas of, um, of, uh, of our interest in terms of our objectives. The first objective was to assess the efficacy of exercise to improve gait and mobility. So we looked at a number of gait speed tests. The primary outcome measure was the six-minute walk, and that involves how many feet the distance somebody walks over a period of six minutes. The Low intensity treadmill group and the stretching resistance group had significant improvements in their distance, whereas the high intensity treadmill group had a trend of improvement, but it did not reach statistical significance. 
There are a number of other gait speed tests that we uh, also applied. And overall, the low intensity treadmill group had the most consistent improvements in all of the gait speed measures. Another, uh, another uh, objective was to look at the efficacy of exercise to improve cardiovascular fitness. And in this regard, we saw significant improvements in terms of the peak VO2, which is considered the gold standard measure of fitness, as well as METs. We saw significant improvements in both the low intensity and in high intensity treadmill groups with no significant improvement in the stretching resistance group. Another uh, objective was to look at the efficacy of exercise to improve disease severity in Parkinson's disease and disability, and this applied the gold standard measure for Parkinson's disease known as the UPDRS, or Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. So in this case, we saw only a significant change on the what's known as the motor subscale of the UPDRS, this is the neuro neurologist's actual examination of the patient, which is rated on the scale. And the only group that showed significant improvement was the stretching resistance arm. We were also interested as a secondary outcome measure in whether exercise improved what we call non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And these include things like depression, apathy, fatigue, quality of life and something called fall self-efficacy, somebody's confidence in that they can uh, prevent or manage falls. We didn't see any significant changes in any of the non-motor outcomes following training with any of the three exercise models. So there are a number of conclusions to derive from the study. Training effects were seen across all three exercise models. The exercise was shown to improve both gait speed and cardiovascular fitness. Both the high and low intensity treadmill training resulted in improvements in gait speed, mobility, and fitness. But importantly, it wasn't necessary to greatly increase the intensity of walking to achieve these benefits. Overall, the low intensity treadmill training, walking at a comfortable pace for a longer duration, resulted in the most significant improvements in gait speed and mobility. The stretching and resistance group improved gait and mobility more than, frankly, was anticipated. This non-treadmill arm of the study resulted in improvements in the six-minute walk that exceeded the results of high-intensity gait training. Somewhat surprisingly, there were no improvements on a range of non-motor outcomes uh, following the three months of training. And this may be because when we're looking at the data now, we're seeing that people who are interested in participating in this kind of study tend to be somewhat above normal in terms of their um, depression levels and other, and other factors. We were not able to show translation of the improvements in gait and fitness to daily function. In other words, our measures of disability did not show significant changes, and that is disappointing. And it's possible that that's just the case, but it is also possible that we don't have adequately sensitive measures of daily function and disability. And the stretching resistance group was the only type of training that improved the motor examination of Parkinsonian symptoms. So overall, our patients ask us all the time, what should I do for myself? What kind of exercise might I do to uh, help uh, my symptoms of Parkinson's disease? And these results suggest that a combination of low-intensity treadmill training plus stretching and resistance training is likely to provide the greatest range of improvements for gait, mobility, and cardiovascular fitness in Parkinson's disease. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shulman. Um, now we'll take some questions from the gallery.